Well, welcome everyone. Well done in making your way, making your way to us, um, finding your way through the maze of hospital. Before you know it, it will be second nature, and you'll know your way around. Um, but we know that on the first uh, day, it can be quite, quite a, a tricky thing to manage. Uh, so my name is Catherine Lynette Young. I'm one of the lecturers and clinical educators in the speech pathology program. I've worked for the university for about 12 years and my area of teaching is paediatric speech and language and I've been fortunate to work and still work uh, clinically as a speech pathologist um, for over 30 years. So that's the passion that I bring to teaching you all, uh, and I'm also the student engagement coordinator, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that role is later. And hi everyone, I'm Jo Murray, and I'm the course coordinator for the Bachelor of Speech Pathology program. I'm also one of your lecturers, um, but usually you don't catch up with me until third year. Um, I teach the adult language and complex adults topic. Um, and we'll talk to you about what that all means and how our program is set out in a minute. So thank you and nice to see all your smiling faces and well done for being early. Um, and yeah, hopefully we're going to have a really good day. So before we go any further though, it's really important that we acknowledge the land that we are on today. We recognise that Flinders University operates on the Indigenous people's traditional lands and waters and acknowledge their continued responsibility to care for country at the university's various teaching locations. So clearly, uh, currently in the Bedford Park campus where we are, we're on Ghana land, uh, but there are many other um, Aboriginal peoples um, whose lands may be represented from the places that you come from as well. And it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So let's go through a welcome video from um, the Vice-Chancellor um, from the University uh, who recorded this for you all. Hi, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to Flinders University. Every year it's terrific to see new faces on campus and to know that so many people have chosen to study here at Flinders. I love walking through the hub, feeling that incredible buzz and seeing students just like you, talking to new friends, sharing ideas, helping each other out. These are just some of the things that make Flinders such a wonderful place to study, as I'm sure you'll discover once you find your feet. Your first few days may seem a bit of a blur. We've all been there. Starting university is a big step and it takes time to learn all the ins and outs. But don't worry, plenty of supports available to help make your transition to life at Flinders as easy as possible. Flinders staff and student ambassadors can help you find your way. And I know from experience that your fellow students are kind, inclusive and always ready to help. So where do you begin? Well, Flinders website's a great starting point. You'll find campus maps and plenty of information about university life. Our Ask Flinders Facebook page will keep you up to date on university events and Flinders news. Flinders also has a busy social scene. And Flinders University Student Association, FUSA, can help you find social clubs and many other activities. As well as online support, we also provide support in person at our campus locations at Sturt, Tonsley, Victoria Square, Regional South Australia and across the Northern Territory. Here at Bedford Park, the Flinders Connect team in the hub can answer questions about enrolments and course information. The Student Learning Centre within Flinders Library is also a great resource for any academic help that you might need. Our confidential and professional health, counselling and disability services are available to all students. And Flinders Oasis drop-in centre is a warm and inviting space for people from all backgrounds to socialise. Oh, and of course, Bedford Park has 
plenty of food outlets, although I'm sure you've discovered those for yourself already. I'm confident that you're gonna love being a student here at Flinders University, and I hope you're gonna have the time of your life. Great, so that's our, our Vice-Chancellor, um, Colin Sterling. Now we thought it would, and some of the things that he talked about in that um, video, we'll be having uh, guest presenters come and talk um, with you today. So let's just have a bit of a look at how things are gonna run today. So um, we have activities planned up until about 2.30 um, after, um, and, and we'll go through a range um, of these areas as I mentioned. So we're going to um, spend time together now until about 10.30, and then we'll have a short break. Um, we're gonna go through some of the major questions that students have about the um, Bachelor of Speech Pathology first year um, program, and cover some of those important um, details that um, we know is always useful for students to know. After the break, our academic lead will be introducing um, herself. Welcome, come and find a spot. We know it's been tricky to get into the building today, so um, find, find a spot. Um, and then we'll have um, reps from two of our associations, um, FUSPA, which is the Flinders University Speech Pathology and Audiology Association, to come and talk with you about their benefits as well as the Flinders University Rural Health um, Society as well to talk about um, the benefits of being involved in those clubs. Um, and then as Colin mentioned in his um, YouTube clip then, um, somebody from FUSA will come and talk about the benefits um, and supports available at the Student Association FUSA um, and Health and Counselling will also be joining us. Um, we'll have a short break before you then meet more of your um, third year Bachelor of Speech Pathology um, mentors. So you've met some of them on the way in today, um, checking your names off, um, and they will be supporting you in small groups um, throughout your first semester in the program. Then um, we'll be having lunch, which is provided by the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. Um, and the Master of Speech Pathology students who are also having their orientation today and are in, and are in the lecture um, theatre next to us uh, will be um, mingling with us for lunch then as well. Um, and then you can have a chance to have your first kind of chat with your student mentor. You will get to meet who is going to be the mentor. You have been allocated to mentor groups. Um, and you will get to meet um, those people. And then they will take you on a bit of a tour of the campus um, to show you the um, most important spots for you to uh, know about uh, from a student perspective. Because we could show you what we think is important, but they, they know the um, inside knowledge of, of what is important. Any questions before we get moving into uh, getting to know you, um, getting to know each other activity. It's always so exciting to see our first group, isn't it? Our first years. So for those who've just come in, um, I'm Jo Murray. I'm the course coordinator for the Bachelor of Speech Pathology program. And this is Catherine. Catherine's one of our lecturers and also our student engagement coordinator. So we're running the show today for you, um, but you will see us around as, as your lecturers as you go through the program. Um, I might just come and collect, if, perhaps if you could pass your forms down um, to, the, to the, what's that, your left. I'll come and collect them. Uh, sure. And yeah. yeah. Sounds like a good plan. As we all know, such a new world with, with managing COVID safety, keeping everybody safe.
Great. Thank you for filling out those forms for the hospital executive who are very keen to make sure that we keep and clear track of everybody um, here. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I, one of my roles uh, within the speech pathology teaching team is student engagement coordinator. And what that means is if you're having some difficulties, you're not sure where to go for help around um, study support, around um, issues that you might be having um, to, around your study, uh, around mental health and wellbeing, you're looking for particular supports, um, I'm the person as first person, first point of contact to um, get in touch with me. We can make a time and have a chat um, either in my office in our department, which is on level seven of Flinders Medical Centre. We'll be giving you more information about that um, today. Um, or we can um, arrange that through video chat as we have all become very good at doing um, in the last 12 months is being flexible and having that. Um, possibility. So uh, sometimes I meet with students with Joe as course coordinator. Um, if students are particularly wanting to talk about how things are going for them in the program, so keep that in mind. There are lots of supports available um, for your time here. But now's the time for us to get to know each other a little bit more because we're really aware that some people might have studied at university before. For others, it might be your very first um, entry into study um, at university. And we like to get an idea about the different range of people uh, who are here. So I'm going to be reading out some statements. And what your job is, is to stand up if it applies to you, OK? so that we can get a bit of an idea around the diversity of experiences and backgrounds that we have in our first year cohort. Now, we should have mentioned earlier that this is not all of you, okay? We have 108 Eight. students enrolled in first year um, in the bachelor program. Not everybody was able to be here today. One of those reasons is because we had a cap on the numbers that could come um, because of COVID safety. Um, but we do have, um, so this is, there'll be an extra 40 or so students um, in your uh, program as well. So I would like you to, the first um, statement is if you can stand up if you came here by bus. Who caught a bus here today? Great. Excellent. Um, how long did it take, some of you? Was it a long trip or a shorter trip? Or if you came by bus? Just half an hour? Yeah, great. 45 minutes, yeah. So, yes, not always the quickest coming, coming by bus, is it? But that's great. So you've already discovered your quick way in here by bus. Fantastic. Thank you. Did anybody come here by the new train service? Yes. Oh, Fantastic. Excellent. How was it? Yeah. <laughs> Haven't caught the new train yet. No. So that's it's um, obviously only came online in December. So you're our first cohort of students to get to experience that option yeah. to um, come here by come here by train. So that's excellent. Um, did you have to change lines too much to get here? Once, yeah, okay. Great, excellent, thank you. And those who came here by car, how was the parking? Was it all right? Yeah. Got here early. <laughs> it's the number one thing, is to come here early if you are coming by car because the car park is full pretty much by 8.30. Yeah. So um, if you are coming in on campus, which we obviously, as um, Jo mentioned um, early on today, we really do want our students on campus and we have the opportunity to have you back on campus um, after last year. So um, if you are coming, allow that little bit of extra uh, time because 
um, parking can be tricky. Um, and yeah, early is the best. Yes. All right. Um, how about if you stand up if you came with somebody else, if your car pulled here or came on public transport with a friend, you've already got a friend in the program, but you came here together. Great, we've already got some people who, who knew each other. Fantastic, anybody happy to share how you knew each other already? High school, you're at high school together and here you are studying speech pathology, fantastic. Yeah, great. <laughs> Excellent. So you've sourced a way already to connect together. Fantastic. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So now, come on in, you people. Just come and find a spot. Glad you found us. We know it's been tricky today. You've made it. Feels like the safari has been complete. We might have some forms for you to fill in if you haven't already filled in one of those COVID forms. Have you filled in a COVID form? Yes. yes? Okay, fantastic. We will collect those from you. Um, oh, they did? Okay. Good. It's all happening. Fantastic. We're just doing a getting to know you activity to find out the, di the diversity of people um, in the room. So this time, if you can stand up, if you have siblings. Oh, that's me as well. So the majority of people have siblings, great. So who has more than two siblings? If you can keep standing up, if you have more than two siblings. Who has more than three siblings? More than four? Wow, so how many do our remaining standing siblings? Five siblings? Wow. Seven? Seven. Oh, goodness. Five. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> My mum was the eldest of seven, so yes. Okay. We're of big families. Mm. Yes. Great, fantastic. So if you can stand up now if you've studied previously at university. Excellent, that's a, a great spread. So who's happy to share some of the programs that you have been in before? Bachelor of Visual Arts, great, thank you. Excellent. We certainly have a number of speech pathology students who come in having had a music background. Mm. Yeah, music, arts, performing background. Yeah. yeah. We've had opera singers, mm. jazz singers, um, other musicians. Yes. So We've had a couple on The Voice, haven't we? Absolutely. <laughs> We've had a couple of uh, our students who have been on The Voice in previous years. Some who have combined acting as well as, as, well as speech pathology and singing as well as speech pathology. Mm. Music therapy. Yes, yeah. Other backgrounds? Mm-hmm, great. Great, fantastic. Uh-huh, so you've got that in common, the marketing, <laughs> marketing event there. That'll come in very handy later on when you've graduated, sure. No, it will. Any other different types of areas? Oh, great. Very helpful yeah, very for helpful. linguistics and phonetics, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Also yeah. very helpful, very yes, helpful. these are all helpful. Anyone else? Great, thank you so much. Yeah. It's really always really interesting to hear that background. Next door in the Masters of Speech Pathology program, obviously they all have an um, undergraduate degree and um, so those students come from diverse backgrounds, from biomedical kind of backgrounds to from teaching, some from performance, as I mentioned before, um, some from uh, education, all kinds. Mm. 
nursing as well. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. So stand up then if it's your first time at uni. This is your very first day being at uni. So it's always the majority of our students is the first day at university, so welcome. Jo and I, can, jo and I both studied with Flinders Uni, so we, we remember what it was like. Yeah. We went through one year apart. We so did. <laughs> there you go, all those years ago. <laughs> we were on the Sturt campus then. Yeah. Yeah, mm. and um, so we remember what it was yeah, like I being that very first first day. I remember Straight my, out of school, I was. Yeah, me too. I remember orientation very, very well. So um, welcome. It's very um, interesting. A mixture of nervousness and excitement. I'm very sure. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. So now it's good to find out if we have any parents in the room. So standing up if you're a parent. Excellent. Always great to have uh, um, parents because you bring that different perspective uh, when you're studying child development as your one of your second semester topics. Um, that always really comes in handy for sure um, to have that background. Um, so great. Thank you. So how about if you come from a rural area, be it in South Australia or not? So what are some of the diversity of places that we have people coming from? Sorry. Mount Gambier, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Great, so the Riverland, yeah. Uh huh. Great. Which part of the York Peninsula? Uh huh. Yep. Down that end. Good. Uh huh. Great. Mm hmm. Oh, yes. Panola. My mum was a teacher. That was her first school that she taught at, was Panola. A very long time ago. Wow, great, welcome. Ah, excellent. That's great. Both Joe and I, jo and I have experience in um, either working in rural areas or... Yeah, I worked in Port Augusta for many years. And where did you work, Catherine? Uh, so I didn't work rurally, but I grew up rurally. Oh. So, um, yeah, all in tiny country towns all around um, all around South Australia. So welcome. Um, it's We know that it's a different experience to come to university from a rural area as well, um, kind of as that added kind of layer of complexity for you. So we certainly have lots of supports um, available. Um, so now if you can stand up if you were born in Australia. So majority of people were born here in Australia. Um, fantastic. So now if we could, um, so how about if you sit down if you were born somewhere other than South Australia? So still Australia, but not in South Australia. So we've got people born from other states, yeah? Great. Fantastic. Thank you. So what other countries do we have people from if you weren't born in Australia? America. Mm-hmm. Which particular state? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That's great. One of our lecturers is uh, from South Africa. Did her under did her degrees in one of her degrees in South Africa? Yeah. Welcome. Come on in. <laughs> well done finding us. So, have we missed any other countries that people were born in? Mm-hmm. Great. 
Excellent, lovely to see the um, diversity of people that we have here. So now if you could stand up if you have pets. Oh, now, this is the bit where we like to know the most exotic pets mm. that we have in the room. So I have a blue healer who's not terribly exotic. He's kind of quintessential Australian pet, really. Um, and I have a poodle cross who's <laughs> not at all exotic. <laughs> by the name of Buster, and last year when we were teaching online, he often made an appearance <laughs> for the students <laughs> and uh, with his prolapsed trachea, <laughs> had, had a very loud cough interrupting my lectures at times. Yes, we did get to meet different people's pets teaching online and I found that working with clients online, actually, it was great. I got to meet clients' pets as well. So what range of pets do we have here from this group? Dogs, chickens. How many chickens do you have? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So you must have a very healthy egg supply. Yes, for the neighbourhood. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Fantastic. Other pets apart from dogs and chickens? Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. That sounds very cute. <laughs> Anything else? Any other different types of pets? Any reptiles? Nobody with reptiles? No? Usually we have somebody with a reptile, but not this year. Maybe it's in the group that's not here today. Mm. Yeah. Cats? Yes. A few nods for cats. Any other small... Oh. oh, so, you know, anybody looking for a kitten? Um, <laughs> know where to go? Great, thank you. All right, so you might might need to stand up again if you play sport, if you're a sporting person. Great, got a few sports people. Do we have any, I don't know if we have any elite athletes in first year this year? No. Do you want an elite athlete, Ashley? No, we have. If you're an elite athlete, you can get special status with Flinders University. Hmm. There's criteria around what elite means. And, um, yeah, we can do flexible study plans and so on. So if you are at a very high level with your sport, do look into that elite athlete status at Flinders University. Yeah. We have... We usually have at least one or two who yeah. are somewhere we've in the program. We've had netballers, we've had squash players, we've had taekwondo... Olympians, we've had um, pistol shooters. Um, what else have we had? Yeah, so we have a soccer. Current, yeah, current student who's um, looking to qualify for the next Olympics hmm. in shooting. Yes. Yeah. So she's doing hybrid first year, second year. So you might might meet her later this year. But what range of sports do you? Do the people in the room play? Is it team sports or solo? Netball. Yeah. Netball. Yep, shout them out. Footy and softball. Any other different from those? Ooh. Wow. Excellent. Uh huh. Great. One of my dear friends who's been, who has been a speech pathologist uh, for a very long time as well as a surf, is still a surf lifesaver and uh, did that Rottnest Island swim last year, the scary one. Um, anything else? I'm a swimmer, but any other? Sorry? Oh, fantastic. Yes. 
you should have a chat with one of our audiologists who is um, into dressage. Seriously, she's teaching her, um, what's he called her? He's one of those massive horses. Um, yeah, he is. He's a Clydesdale. She's going to do dressage with him. <laughs> if you can picture that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So now we're going to think more about the profession of speech pathology. So if you could stand up if you've spent time with a speech pathologist before in any capacity. Great. So who's happy to share how they've talked with a speech pathologist before? Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. So that was adult type yeah. focus. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Excellent. Yeah. What suburbs were you in? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> they, they have their tentacles very wide. The um, education department, speech pathology. Yeah. Mm hmm Great. Yeah. Was that with... No, no, okay. Yes, yeah, yep, yeah, great. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what did you decide? <laughs> very glad you decided to join us. Certainly we ha have had um, many parents over the years who that's been part of their decision to come into speech pathology is having experienced it personally, yeah, with their children. Yes, yeah, great. Any different types of experiences with speech pathologists? Right, yeah, so you have regular contact, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. It's always great to know who had that contact. Had you had any contact with a speech pathologist before you came into the course? Um, yeah, I went and did work experience. So mm. as part of the Year 10 work experience program at my high school and I knew right from the very beginning that's what I wanted to do. Um, got really good results in year 12 and my deputy principal was trying to talk me into doing medicine because as if that's the only thing you can do when you're really smart, you know. <laughs> I said, no, I want to do speech pathology. So I was pretty pretty set in my ways, you know, right from the beginning and I've certainly, you know, had lots of different experiences in my career as a speech pathologist and now as an academic, um, but it's pretty much the career I chose right from the beginning. And I know that's not the case for everyone, but mm. it was for me. Yeah. I just read it in a SATAP guide and thought it sounded like me because I like to talk a lot. <laughs> and, um, and, I know, and as many of you may share, um, I, w I want this similar feeling. I wanted to work in an area where I could make a difference for people's lives. And I know that sounds really cheesy, but it absolutely is what we do. That is fundamental for what speech pathologists do. Um, communication is a basic um, human right um, and we support, we have the privilege um, of supporting people to um, achieve that. So, um, but oh yeah, had no idea. Read about it, thought, oh, that sounds like it might be okay. And feel very fortunate that I uh, found something that, um, so if you haven't had experience with a speech pathologist before, don't worry, it's okay. Um, it's, you can still absolutely, of course, make it um, your career. So just a couple more as we get to know each other. Um, so standing up if you've been involved in theatre or the arts in any way, performing in any way. Yeah, great. It's always lovely to see the, the range because that's also been a uh, passion of 
mine and my husband is involved in that industry. So um, it's always great to see um, who's involved in that. So what diversity do we have? So we know we have a musician, uh, done a music uh, degree, yeah. Was it singing? Oh, wow, amazing. So what other, what other performing arts do we have? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Great. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. Triple threat, yes. Just like being in musical theatre, you have to be multi-talented. Anything else? Any dancers? Yeah. yeah. I did ballet for a long time. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Within our speech pathology teaching team, we have an ex-professional dancer. She was a contemporary dancer. We have a current singer, performer and our newest team member also has an acting degree. She was an actor before she came into speech pathology. Oh, no, she was just telling me that yesterday. I found that out. So, um, yeah, so it's really, um, it comes in very handy. Um, now, if you can stand up, if you speak more than one language. I always love to see the diversity of our bilingual and multilingual students because, and for you, I have to sit down because I'm, I'm a, <laughs> a monolinguist. Um, so what types of languages do we have in the room? Mm -hmm. Polish. So we have Greek, Polish. Uh huh. Great. Wonderful. Mm hmm. Great. Any other languages? German for me. Covered them all? Is that our range of languages? Urdu. What was that, sorry? Urdu. Ah, thank you, Urdu. Urdu. Wonderful. Camel. Uh huh, camel. Great. I'm taking note here because <laughs> <laughs> in third year we talk about bilingual aphasia. So aphasia is a language impairment that people can have after a stroke, for example, um, as an acquired language disorder. And so as speech pathologists, we work with those people. But if they have an aphasia, a language impairment in two languages or even three languages, um, it adds that level of complexity and we need to work out how we work with people who are bilingual or multilingual before they have their stroke and acquire a language disorder. Um, so one of the sessions that I run is actually with an interpreter and we do an aphasia assessment in the other language. So I'm always looking for students who speak two or three languages to volunteer for me to role play my patient with bilingual aphasia. So um, I'll be coming knocking on your door in third <laughs> year, some of you. <laughs> So that's great to know. Thanks. Thank you so much. All righty. So um, our last one is if you know anyone in the course already. So it might be in first year or it might be in other years. Oh, wow. Great. So we've got a whole heap of people. So um, you know people from other years? Uh, yeah, just yell it out. Oh, my cousin's in fourth year. Great. Oh, fantastic. 
exciting. You'll be able to get lots of tips and pass textbooks. Yes. yes. <laughs> One of our second year mentors was just um, telling me first thing this morning that he's um, selling all the textbooks. So um, he'll be, be third year now, Catherine. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. in third year now. Yeah. So he'll be selling some. Other experiences? Uh, what other contacts do you have in the course? In the course. Right. <laughs> Great. Mm hmm Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Really great to get an idea of the diversity um, amongst, our, mm. amongst our students, for sure. So our next set of slides are some of the um, ones that have been put together by our College of Nursing and Health Sciences. Um, to kind of take us through some more of those essentials about getting things sorted in terms of your um, involvement at uni here. Mm. Yeah. Do you want me to have a... Mm. I'll have a bit of a chat. <laughs> so um, for those of you who came in and, and didn't uh, hear our introductions, I'm Jo Murray. I'm the course coordinator for the Bachelor of Speech Pathology program. Um, and I'm very short, so if you can see me over the lectern, you're doing well. Um, now, I think most of you in, are enrolled because I've uh, been getting a list of your names from our student management system. Um, but just making sure that if you haven't already rolled in all of your topics for semester one, and I'll run through what they, those are in a minute, um, just make sure that you do get, do get enrolled and um, allocated to the classes appropriately. Um, but there's a, a contact there for student enrolment if you need any support with that. Um, and also that website there, sorry, that link gives you the important dates for semester one. So the important dates are really um, when the semester contact time is um, at uni, when the mid-semester break is. I'm sure you'll be really looking forward to when the end of semester is when the exam periods are, um, but also importantly, um, the census date. Now, I've never heard of a census date before I came to university. That's basically the last day you've got to withdraw from a course before um, you get uh, fees um, applied, I suppose. So if you're thinking this isn't the course for you, at, try and kind of come to that decision before census date or certainly be talking to some of us as your topic coordinators, your course coordinator, your student engagement coordinator um, about that decision and try and make that decision before census date, okay? I think for us it's uh, it's in April and I think it's the 4th. I think, it, I think it might be. I don't know why they did it this year. It's on April the 2nd, so it's on East Good Friday. It's April the 2nd, mm, there you go. Good Friday. So you've got a month. Yeah, you know, to start mm. thinking about mm. things. Not that we want any of you to unenrol, um, that's for sure. But it's a really important date to keep in mind if, if you know, depending on how things go for you this semester. Um, your student ID card really, really important. Um, not only for identification for things like getting into Flinders Medical Centre, um, but also, of course, for borrowing from the library, um, sitting exams. Um, if you want to do any printing in the library, for example, you need your um, student ID card. So if you haven't already got one, um, there's some information there about how you do that. Getting your concession on public transport, all of those kinds of yeah. things. Um, if you require any textbooks or resources, we will definitely be letting you know through your individual Flow sites. Flow is Flinders Learning Online and each topic that you're enrolled in will have its own flow site and there'll be lists there of textbooks that you might need to purchase. Um, and there's many 
options for purchasing textbooks, including secondhand ones, as we said, through our previous students. Um, so there's some information there about collecting and buying textbooks. Uh, and of course, all of the textbooks that we recommend will be in the library as well for borrowing. Um, we've talked about car parking already. Um, basically this week it's free, but otherwise you do need to get a parking permit. And if you log on to Flinders um, website and just forward slash parking, you'll see what the options are for purchasing um, a ticket basically to park um, for the year. So it's all virtual, so the way that it works is that um, the, there are scanners that um, look at your car, uh, your vehicle registration on your way into the car park. You don't have a ticket that you display or anything like that. Um, and so um, it's important that you register the, the vehicle that you'll be using the most. And there is an option if you actually change the vehicle, if you drive uh, your husband's car or you get a loan car from the mechanic or whatever, um, you can actually go online to that same website and change over the registration of the car. That's really important to do, otherwise you might get a fine. Okay. Um, and as you do, um, may or may not know, we have a loop service um, that actually goes between the campuses that belong to Flinders University uh, in this neighbourhood. So we've got Flinders Medical Centre, Sturt Campus, the main campus and Tonsley. And the Loop um, bus visits very regularly every 10 minutes or so to help transport around those campuses. Um, generally, we find most of our study is at Flinders Medical Centre or the Health Sciences lecture theatre complex or health sciences building just um, through the tunnel, under the road and up the hill a little. So we find we don't use that loop bus very often, but if you have got lectures or activities off campus, um, that certainly is there for you. And there's the new train, as some of you have found out. Um, so that's a really great new initiative, the Transport Inn, really. Um, scholarships, just so that you know, there are a wide range of scholarships that are available to students who are commencing study. Um, and you don't always have to be a top performing study to a, a student to apply. There are multiple different types of scholarships. Um, so visit that link there, the website there, um, if you're interested in eligibility criteria and need a bit of support. Um, you know, to, to get through your studies, by all means, look into that. Um, the Wi-Fi that we have here is available to all students for free, of course, and the Wi-Fi name, the network is um, EduRoam, E-D-U, Roam, and your username and password will be your FAN and whatever you set, you've set up as your password. So everybody knows what a FAN is, uh, it's a, f what is it? Sorry. Flinders authentication number. Thank mm. you, Flinders authentication number. So you will all have a fan as a new student at Flinders. Um, and so you get access to um, the Wi-Fi network. You will get very used to using your fan over and over because it's really important for, you know, as you know, it's part of your email address as a student. Yep. Um, it is um, your access to the Okta page, which we will go on to in a minute, but yeah, you'll, get, you'll use it lots. Yeah. Um, I might hand over to you, Catherine. Sure. To talk about this one. Yes. Yeah. So, um, this um, information is just from a study that was done a few years ago, which involved three um, different universities um, across uh, Australia, which um, wanted to capture um, students' experiences around how study at university is different from study that you might have experienced at school or at TAFE. So, um, as we found out today, some of you already have that experience, you know those differences with um, study, but it's useful to um, hear a couple of stories from um, this survey. So, really interestingly, um, particularly for those who haven't studied at university before, 
um, a high number of students aren't really clear about the expectations of them as students at university um, and how much time university is going to require. Now, we always like to add at this point that speech pathology requires a lot of time. It is very hard to maintain um, significant days of employment, as in, like we've had some students in the past who trying to do the course working four days a week. It's just not viable um, because of the amount of study time that you will need to put in. I know that sounds like I'm being doom and gloom, but I'm just trying to be clear about the amount of time you will need to spend on study in order to um, be successful through the program. So the recommended amount of study for university subjects is six to 10 hours per week per subject, which is on top of your actual time that you're in classes. Um, and that's double what is expected of you at school. I remember um, myself, and obviously this was decades ago, but I remember being told that, oh, you know, your last year at, at high school um, is going to be your hardest year of study. And then I started speech pathology and went, they lied. <laughs> they absolutely lied. That's not true. Um, it is very intensive. It is intensive study in a diverse range of areas in foundation skills that you will need to then bring, that you need to have solid knowledge of so that you can manage second year and then your subsequent years on from that. So um, it, it's a lot. Um, and this comes from this student and staff expectations and experiences project, um, as I mentioned. So it found that 71% of continuing students reported that the standard of university work is different or extremely different to school work. Now, one of the areas that that is in is in terms of referencing and your need to demonstrate the sources of information that you are using. Um, one of your first year topics really supports you with that and takes you through all of the information about how to use APA referencing, which is the standard um, referencing system that we use across um, our entire programs, both of our programs. Um, so that is really important to get your head around um, how to do that. And as I said, one of your topics, Introduction to Clinical Skills, um, takes you through um, that information. But depending on the school that you went to um, and the way that they um, used referencing, some schools introduce referencing to students in year eight and nine. Some don't do it terribly well, is our experience. And so it just, it depends a lot. So there is support available with that, with our Student Learning Centre, um, which is up in the um, hub in the main campus of the university. There's lots of supports around, so make sure that if you're having any difficulties with that area, then um, seek that support. Um, over two thirds of new university students um, believe that um, us as your teachers would provide all the materials that you need. We don't. We point you in the right direction and we're here and we have forums to to help support you with your learning, um, but in reality, you need to learn to source information yourself, um, which can be quite different um, from, from what you're used to. So then step two um, is to get prepared. Um, so you may or may not have started some of the activities yesterday, or you may have waited until today, which is absolutely great, it's fine. Um, but there are campus tours leaving every hour uh, between 10 and 3 um, at the campus tour booth on the plaza, um, which is um, up the hub, and that is where your mentors will take you um, to later. So you might want to come back on another day this week to do um, one of those campus tours, which covers the entire campus, um, but our mentors will be taking you through the most important um, areas. There's also a welcome hub um, in the student hub um, up on the main campus. There's um, an overheard at Flinders Facebook um, page and I remember when my daughter was studying here um, at Flinders, she's a primary school teacher, 
Um, she said, Mum, I read this today on the Facebook page. It said, um, every day is leg day at Flinders um, because if you're going up to health sciences or you're going up to um, the main campus, we do get to use our legs quite a lot. There's a lot of stairs. So every day, <laughs> every day is leg day um, at Flinders. Um, so there are, um, there's lots of, and that's why the loop bus is helpful if you're needing to go um, to Sturt campus for any uh, reason. So there are some different, so in here in Flinders Medical Centre, um, just outside the medical library, which the students will show you, they also are running um, campus tours um, from there as well. So um, there is a topic, once you've um, signed in, got your fan, which sounds like everybody's got that sorted, there is a topic site on Flow, on Flinders Learning Online, um, called Finding Your Way at Flinders. And really recommend that you take um, a moment to have a look at that, um, to look through some of the resources that are there. They've been carefully put together for you to help you um, find, funnily enough, to help you find your way at Flinders, um, which is um, helpful. Welcome. No worries, glad you found us. So there are a range of services to support you through your university journey, including academic, um, so there's some online supports as well as face-to-face, -face, um, uh, career supports, wellbeing, um, as we mentioned, um, and financial support. Um, so the link uh, that's listed at the bottom of this slide takes you to all of those different options, financial support, health and counselling, um, if you feel that you might qualify for a um, access plan, which is a plan that is for students who may have a particular um, disability in some area, chronic medical issue, uh, mental health issue, where you feel that you might benefit from additional time in exams, for example, then um, make a time to see one of the um, disability advisors and they will be able to talk you through um, your eligibility for that. Um, so that's something important to keep in mind. All of that is listed on the visit um, students.flinders.edu.au um, slash support. So the orientation um, of the entire college wanted us to also include this really important information about safety online. Um, all of you here are probably very familiar with safety um, online. Um, however, um, it does, we know that it does occur in our society and so um, we do have methods to support you if you're experiencing any threatening beha behaviour through um, the online um, virtual um, sphere. Um, so if you're having any difficulties, please look at the Safety on Campus webpage. Come and chat with me as Student um, Engagement Coordinator. Um, you can email issues if you prefer to do it um, that way to, um, again, to the um, link that's here. There's also a Student Equal Opportunity Advisor who is fabulous who is there to um, support as well. So um, we don't want anybody to feel, on, to feel unsafe on campus, whether that's virtually on campus or whether it's when you're physically here. So please use, um, you know, know that those support services um, are there. You can also make a um, report around um, online harassment um, outside of Flinders University um, through this e-safety um, link there below. We wish it didn't exist, but we know that it does, so um, making you aware of those supports is really important. And if you don't get support first, then um, keep trying, come to talk to one of us, as I mentioned to me as um, Student Engagement Coordinator. So now we need to just take you through a fun video um, about evacuation of the building um, and emergency um, procedures for here at Flinders.
Hi. Today I'm here to talk to you about the emergency evacuation procedures at Flinders University. This short video will guide you through what to do in the event of an emergency to ensure an orderly and safe evacuation. All right, the uh, principles of uh, narrative unity... When you hear the alert tone, please cease interfloor movement and await further instructions via the public announcement system or from the warden. Okay, that, that would be our first warning signal. Please stay calm and uh, I'll proceed with the lecture. These when you hear the evacuation tone, please immediately cease what you are doing, pack up your personal belongings, and listen to your lecturer or the warden for instructions on evacuating the building. Look for the green running man and exit signs, and ensure you take the most direct route to exit the building while avoiding areas that may be affected by fire. It is important not to run when leaving the building. Lifts cannot be used in the case of a fire. Please use the stairs. Disabled, aged and injured persons who are unable to descend stairs should take refuge in the stairwell, ensuring not to block the way out. Staff will advise the fire service accordingly. Once you have exited the building, please move to the assembly point. Please do not return to the building until you have been told it is safe to do so. If you have any questions about this presentation, please ask your lecturer or warden. And I can guarantee that they do have drills. We had one last week at Sturt campus where the student clinic that um, I supervise students um, in, which is called health to go um, We had an um, evacuation um, practice that meant all of our clients had to um, leave, the <laughs> leave the clinic as well. Um, so we do take that very seriously to make sure that you are aware of what to do. Um, not that we've ever had to do it in, um, for real, no. for a, a real danger, um, but we do have those practices mm -hmm. from time to time. So if you're in this area in the lecture theatres around level five here, um, the evacuation point is out in the courtyard through the doors where we'll be going for our lunch today. Um, so it's fairly easy to know where to go. So in an orderly fashion, we all just walk out the stairs, out of the exit and out of the level five exit. There is more information that we'll be going the, through with you, uh, not today, but in your first um, lectures next week. Um, which will take you through more um, emergency and safety information and you're required um, as of this year to um, fill out a questionnaire to show that you're understanding all of those um, requirements around safety. Um, there is a security service, as you discovered, because it was tricky to get in the building, um, that is um, here on um, campus um, and you can contact um, the security service 24 hours um, a day. Um, and there is also um, a link here for reporting security incidents. All of these are available on the Flinders University website. We've just put them together in these slides so that they're easy to find and we will be putting these slides up on the Bachelor of Speech Pathology general flow site so that you can access and get back to them um, at any time. So, now, speech pathology itself. <laughs> We're actually quite small in comparison to some um, programs and for those of you who've studied before, um, might be um, considerably smaller than um, the programs that you've been um, involved with previously. Although we're growing. We sure are. <laughs> Every year we get more and more first years, which means through second year, third year, fourth year, um, we grow and grow and grow. Yes, we do. So. Um, and as you probably are aware, because you've all enrolled in um, Flinders, um, we're the um, first um, Bachelor of um, Speech Pathology program in South Australia, um, and we've been um, running continuously and accredited uh, for over 40 years. Um, so we have a lot of experience um, in teaching you um, about speech pathology and becoming speech pathologists. And we're very glad you joined us. Yes, absolutely. 
So as I mentioned, the speech pathology department is co-located with audiology for obvious reasons. There's lots of links between hearing and uh, communication. And so it's up on at level seven um, here in the medical centre, which you probably all came past the lifts. You may just not have noticed them. Like um, the lifts in the medical centre all have different animals on them, which is the way that people identify which lifts to go up and down in, um, and the which is why lizard lifts is listed on this slide. Um, and again, the um, mentors will take you up to the department to show you um, how to get there in your tour after lunch. Um, most of your classes, as Joe mentioned, will take place here um, in the three lecture theatres that are on level five here or just up the um, hill through the tunnel in the um, health sciences building. So you don't have um, lectures in other spots apart from where are the human bioscience is occurring? Don't know. Not sure. We'll find out when we get to that. Maybe it's dirt. Yeah. Mm. So just to quickly take you through who our um, leadership team are, all here to help you. Um, Jane Bickford is coming to chat with us um, after our break, and she is our academic lead. I'm Joe Murray. <laughs> <laughs> You've met me as course coordinator. Um, Sebastian Dolchin is next door um, as the um, postgraduate um, course coordinator for the master's um, programs. Uh, Jordana Mayo is our placement education um, ex coordinator um, and I'm the student engagement coordinator. Our name has just changed from experience to coordinator, experience to engagement, which is why that's not updated there. So as we mentioned, consider coming to have a chat um, before things get too overwhelming. There are lots of options for, for support. We have the advantage of being a smaller program that we do get to know all of you really, really well. And so we are all here to help and we really do value your health and wellbeing. And so please do um, come and chat um, about anything. Um, and Joe's available to talk about um, progress in terms of academic um, areas as well um, and to support study plans if those are needed. Yeah. So how the program looks from year to year, it's really helpful to know how it is going to change for you um, and why it's designed this way. Mm. So this is where I come in and hopefully this is the exciting bit for you guys and what you're going to be studying. So this is an outline of what the course looks like across your four years, from year one on the left side of the screen to your final year, year four. Um, you'll see the arrows uh, basically are the prerequisites and some of our topics are taught together and they're called co-requisites. So in your first year, um, it's really the foundational topics, as Catherine mentioned, that you'll need um, to get a good understanding when you move through second year and third year about the different disorders and impairments of communication and swallowing that we work with as speech pathologists. Before going straight into the impairments, though, we need to have those foundational studies that help us understand those disorders. And so our topics of psychology and, and um, how psychology and learning and development through the lifespan um, actually relate to speech pathology. That's one of your topics. And your topic coordinator is Kirsty. I think we've got a photo of Kirsty soon. Um, another topic, and this has actually changed this year and uh, shame on me, I haven't updated this uh, course slide yet. Our introduction to anatomy and physiology has now joined with the rest of the health sciences students um, and it's now called Health 1004. So I imagine a number of you have booked in and enrolled into that um, class already, that topic already. Um, that's being taught by Sarah Louise, who used to be 
uh, in speech pathology and teach this topic. So she knows it very, very well um, and wrote much of the content and so she knows what's important for students to learn about anatomy and physiology as it relates to speech, communication, swallowing. So that'll be an introduction topic to anatomy and in your second semester you will apply that anatomy and physiology knowledge to uh, the speech mechanism and the swallowing mechanism and so on, go, um, which will really set you up well for going into second year and learning about the different disorders of swallowing, of voice, of language um, and speech. Um, the next topic you'll do is the 1506 linguistics and phonetics. And again, that's a phonetics introduction, linguistics and phonetics introduction in first semester, going into much more detail and extended knowledge in second semester. And really, really important that you get a good grasp of linguistics, which is the study of language, and phonetics, which is the study of sound. Um, so that we can really start to analyse people's communication difficulties and um, know how and why we're applying the interventions that we're learning to apply. Um, lastly, in first semester, you will have an introduction to clinical skills and practice, which is a really nice topic, um, not only to introduce you to university study and study skills, um, library, database searches to find references and material, how to reference things in your assignments. But it's also a lovely introduction to the profession, where speech pathologists work, how speech pathologists work, what sort of work that we do, what settings that we work in. Um, so you, I think you'll really enjoy uh, that topic. In second semester, you'll then go and do a little bit more in child development and learning. Uh, which is a good precursor then to moving into disorders of child speech and language. So in second semester, uh, second year, I'm sorry, as I say, we move into the real nitty gritty kind of disorders of speech, language um, and swallowing and voice. And that's when uh, I'll first be teaching you is yep. first semester in second year as I teach um, you across the year in terms of child speech uh, difficulties. So you learn about assessment of child speech um, and that is a co-requisite topic with Lauren Sullivan, um, which um, works together. So there are paediatric speech and language topics. Yeah. So they're the first four boxes you see in the second year there. So the PS and CS are professional studies and communication sciences topics and the clinical skills and practice are as they, you know, sound, clinical skills <laughs> and practice. So what we do is we pair uh, more of a theoretical topic with a clinical skills topic so that you actually get an understanding of why you're doing what you're doing and how you do it and then you get to actually practice those skills. Um, so you'll see there the child speech and language topic um, 1A and clinical practice 1A are paired together and then in second semester you go on and do 2A and 2A together, the professional studies and the clinical skills and basically you're looking at child speech and language across from birth to um, adolescence across that year. In the lower part of second year, those boxes there, in uh, first semester, you'll be doing motor speech disorders. So that's where we start to look at the different types of fluency disorders, stuttering, cluttering, um, and also motor speech disorders that are required from, for example, a stroke or a progressive neurological disease that result in what we call dysarthria, which is a um, a motor speech disorder uh, that can be acquired in adults. Um, and that has a paired clinical skills topic as well. In second semester, second year, um, the other topics you do are voice and swallowing. So that's when you'll meet Sebastian, uh, who's next door, and you'll meet Jane, who's our voice specialist, uh, who's coming down to meet us soon. Um, and you'll be looking at the disorders that can occur 
with voice and swallowing. So as you can start to see as I'm talking through this, this is why you need such a good grounding in anatomy and physiology and linguistics and phonetics and psychology and child development. In third year, you'll come across me. I'm teaching in the adult acquired language disorders topic, um, both first and second semester and the clinical skills um, that go along with them. And then you start to put some of all this together, um, looking at children and adults in a much more holistic kind of way, the communities in which they live, work and play, and we look at more complex kind of disorders in paediatrics and complex disorders in adults in third year. What you might notice there too is finally you get to do some prac. So you're actually out on clinical placements in your third year. So 3903 and 3904 are your speech pathology practicums, which are the equivalent of the other topics. So it's about, it's usually a one day a week kind of um, out, in, out in practice, might be in the education department, it might be in childcare, it might be in a hospital, it might be um, health to go with Catherine, it might be in our fluency clinic. So um, various places where, um, you go out on practicum and you'll meet some of our um, topic coordinators that organise the placements at lunchtime today. And then in fourth year, you've got a research topic, um, but then your big clinical practicum. So those of you who had a cousin, I think, in fourth year will be out there. We don't see our fourth years very often. They're not really on campus very much. The research topic is pretty much an online topic and then they're out on their big clinical placements. And then to top it all off at the end, we have our capstone topic, our transition to practice, where everyone comes back in and we kind of have a, have a lovely day of, you know, sending our um, speech pathology students out into the big wide world as graduates and speech pathologists. And it's a really lovely um, topic, that final one, that capstone topic. So that's basically how we go through the program. Um, you will have received some of these yeah, um, now information. Yeah, we're back to the maps. The uh, maps that are available to help you find your way around. Um, these are all online on the yeah. um, Flinders um, Uni website. This is the map here of, um, you can see those yellow, big yellow shaded areas are the three lecture theatres that are in a row. Obviously, we lecture theatre three, the big one at the top. Um, and that will help you find tutorial rooms as well. Oh. So basically these are some of the lecture theatres and tutorial rooms we commonly use, but you never know. So your mentors will take you around and show you these in person. We also have lectures up the hill in the lecture theatre complex. Again, they'll show you where those are and Okay. <laughs> yeah, so now we're on to looking at your timetable. Time so in general, your timetable will look the same um, from week to week, but as Joe mentioned, because we now have the new human biosciences topic, um, you will have enrolled in whatever um, class yes. suits you. Um, and so it will look slightly different for everybody. Um, but we've got a sample, um, but make sure you check your own personal timetable. Check it regularly because updates do occur. So this is what it might look like for your first week next week. But there are all of the options that are available for the health, uh, the human bioscience topics. So don't freak out. You don't need to go to all of them. All of those pink ones. All of those pink <laughs> ones. You will have enrolled. Uh, in um, the lecture, a laboratory and a tutorial for human biosciences. And then you'll have similar things across each of the topics, a lecture, uh, some tutorials, and perhaps some clinical skills workshops as well. Um, so as Catherine said, make sure you check online your own timetable. This will tell you the name of the topic, but also um, where to find it. Lecture theatre um, one, for example, um, the health sciences lecture theatres up the top uh, of the campus, or oh, of, the, 
of the hill from here. Um, some of those laboratories there are at Sturt. So STS is at Sturt. So you're right, Catherine, they will be going down to Sturt campus um, for some of the anatomy labs. Uh, we've got a couple of photos here of the people you're going to meet in your first week in your topics in first semester. Um, Sarah Louise, as I said, is the human bioscience lecturer and topic coordinator for anatomy and physiology. Um, Kirsty is going to be teaching you psychology for the first half of the semester and then Lauren, who you may have met some of you this morning, um, is going to be taking over that topic. You'll meet Claire at lunchtime as well. She'll be teaching you the clinical skills and practice. And we've got a couple of um, lecturers in linguistics and phonetics, um, Kate and Susie, who you will meet next week. Um, so you would have heard me talking about lectures, workshops, tutorials. If you're new to university, sometimes you're not quite sure what's the difference between all of those. So we've just put down a little bit of a definition here for you. Um, lectures are basically kind of a bit like we're doing at the moment, where your lecturer will stand at a lectern and um, talk you through a number of, you know, different information. Um, there will be opportunities still for you to engage and to ask questions and maybe to do some um, activities just at, at your seat on an individual basis or maybe in a pair. But um, most, mostly lectures are kind of just the giving of information um, and mostly they will be recorded. So if they're in the timetable as a lecture, they will be recorded and you'll be able to find those lecture recordings on Flow for each of your topics. So whilst you don't have to attend lectures, we do like our students to attend lectures. We find um, students actually tell us they're able to engage better in the content if they're actually there listening and able to ask questions and so on. But just so you know, lectures will be recorded. Workshops are much more active. So you learn through experience and through doing things. Um, so they're much more... Um, around discussion or practical activities. So you do get the best out of them if you attend them. Some of them, uh, because we've learnt from last year, uh, we can actually do some of them partially online and we can record them. So that is probably going to be the case more so this year than pr in previous years. Also because we've got a few international students who of course can't get here. So they need that information to be able to see and hear what's going on as well in those workshops. Tutorials, however, will not be recorded. These are where you get into your small groups. So you're working on activities, learning activities as a smaller group. Um, because we've got 100 or so, your small groups are going to be still, you know, 10 to 15 students. They're not that small, um, but they're um, smaller in terms of um, you needing to be responsible for your own learning and catching up each other in your group if people can't attend. But of course, we would be encouraging you to attend them. Okay. I'm just going to excuse myself because I need to nip next door just yes. to introduce yes. myself to the master's students. Yeah. Um, so have we got to grow? Um, there are several. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I will see you after the break. Or you might still be going. I just need to go and introduce myself to the master's students. So I'll see you soon. Yeah. I think we'll, um, we will have a break soon. I will leave this here. Oh, yes, you might want to leave that. <laughs> <laughs> so the main form of communication is through your flow site and through email with most of us. Um, so do check your flow sites and your emails regularly. That's all I really wanted to say there. Um, statement of assessment methods, your SAMs, is another important concept. If you haven't been to uni before, if you have, you'll know what your SAMs are. This is the official contract that we have with you, uh, the university and you as a student, uh, that talks about what assessments are required and what you need to be able to do to pass a topic. So it's a really important um, piece of information, it'll be front and centre in your flow site 
and we'll each of your topic coordinators as you start will work through that SAM and topic book with you um, to explain what the content of your topic is going to be for the year of for the semester sorry what the learning outcomes are that are expected what the assessments are that are going to show that you meet those learning outcomes and what are the criteria to show that you're passing okay so that's the SAMs and the topic books all right, I might just skip through this because I might get Jane to talk about Speech Pathology Australia. And this is the final step and then we'll have a break. Um, if you're coming around um, for orientation week, just be aware that the activities continue past this week into the following four weeks. Um, so it's really fantastic to be part of the university and, and to connect with this orientation program. So do check out all of the events at um, the Flinders website there for orientation. Um, there's things like, you know, activities, games, bingo bash in the tavern, comedy, um, quiz nights, markets, um, walks and fairs. So it's all really fun and I think that's the beauty of being a university student. Don't just live your life here at Flinders Medical Centre because you'll be really missing out on what Flinders University life is like. So do check out some of those activities. You'll be going up to the campus to see where they might be later on. And um, if you want a recap on any of this information or even extended information, there's so much available um, for you on that orientation site. Uh, we are going to be going through a bit more of those supports later on and um, knowing also that apart from the mentoring program that we have internally in speech pathology, so you'll be meeting the third year mentors um, very soon, um, there are other university mentoring programs including e-mentoring if um, you actually are studying offshore which a number of our uh, students who will be watching this recording will actually be doing. So um, we'll go through this um, this afternoon when you meet the mentors and basically you're going to meet up with them regularly just as a touch point for any um, questions that you've got, any advice that you need. They've been there, done that, gone through first year, gone through second year and will be able to advise you quickly and easily. So... Um, that's all I wanted to go through. So we went through that very quickly. So perhaps I will just introduce Speech Pathology Australia. Um, so this is our professional association. When you are a graduate and become a speech pathologist, you can become a member of Speech Pathology Australia, but you actually don't have to wait till then. You can be a student member as well. And we highly recommend that you do, but of course that's up to you. Um, it's our professional body um, that helps really maintain the standards and the ethical practice of our profession in Australia. We are a self-regulating profession. We're not registered um, with APRA, which is the Allied Health Professional Association. We're not a registered profession. We are a self-regulating profession. So effectively, we need to ensure as, as a profession that um, only people who are qualified are practising as speech pathologists, only people who are practising ethically are practising in our profession, and so our professional body helps to maintain those standards. It also looks at the standards of university education. So, um, as Catherine mentioned before, we've been accredited for over 40 years as a program, but each year, and including this year, um, we need to provide all of the documentation to our professional body to show why we should still be accredited and why we are producing graduates who can enter our profession competently. So Speech Pathology Australia um, is something to just keep in the back of your mind if you want to look into a student membership and what it can offer you, you can go to the website there. So basically, that's all I wanted to go through for the morning. Let's have a break now. Um, if we can come back at 10 to 11, uh, you'll be meeting Jane, our academic lead. 
if you don't know where to go now, <laughs> um, Flinders Medical Centre has really one coffee stop, coffee shop, cafe close by. And I would recommend, given the experience you've had this morning, that you don't go too far afield or you might not get back in. Um, the coffee uh, spot is down on level four. So if you actually make your way back to the lifts or the corridor that you came down initially, and there's some stairs as well, um, you can head down to level four. Otherwise, there are some um, for, uh, toilets um, just at the end of the lecture theatres, uh, past lecture theatre. This is three, past two, and you'll see them around the corner. Um, if you go outside, you might not get in. So just, I would just sort of recommend hanging around. Um, yeah, so we'll see you back here at 10 to 11. My name's Jane Bickford, so I've, I've just been introduced. Um, I am the academic lead, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a picture about what academic lead is. You, probably you might be thinking more in a traditional sense that I lead the department, um, but here at Flinders we have something called a matrix management structure, which basically means um, that I, my role is strategic uh, in that I'm trying to support the department, and we've got a fantastic group of academics uh, in the discipline of speech pathology uh, with things like accreditation, with our curriculum, um, really supporting the team to go in the direction that they want to go. Um, so, yes. Um, so, I guess, yeah, just trying to think about me in, in relation to that. But I'm also a topic coordinator um, and I'm also a researcher. So my background is that I'm a speech pathologist. I trained at, here at Flinders many, many years ago and I've practised for about 14 years um, and then uh, came back and started to do some um, clinical education, started to do a bit more teaching, um, got, got the kind of bug, if you like, did a PhD uh, and I've been trying to publish, trying to do more research and support honours students uh, as well as um, topic coordinate. So my area is voice, um, the area that I'm uh, interested in, and I will be teaching you that in second year. Um, I um, jointly coordinate with Sebastian Dolk in, in the voice and swallowing topics in second year. I also um, come up again in third year and trying to support um, the understanding of how mental health can really impact um, people that we work with, but also how important it is to learn about certain counselling skills um, to support practice. So, I just wanted to, um, you to think about today, um, how have you communicated? Just have a little quick think about um, the sorts of communication that you've done today and how it's impacted your life and also how you envisage you're going to be communicating for the rest of the day. Do you feel like you've communicated in one way or another? And how has that manifested for you? What does that look like? Has some of it involved talking? Yeah. Has some of it involved writing? Yeah. Has some of it involved reading? So there's lots of things. Okay. So communication is a really critical part of what you do every day. Yeah. Um, what about eating and drinking and swallowing? Is that something you've done today? How, how much do you reckon? How many times have you swallowed today, do you think? 400 times. I don't know. But, but you've taken it for granted, haven't you? So you've taken the fact that you can communicate and talk and read and write for granted and you've also probably taken for granted that you can swallow. So the beautiful thing about this degree is that you're going to become much more aware of what that is and what that looks like um, for yourself, but also for the people that you will be working with. And we'll get an understanding of what it looks like across the lifespan and for a whole group of people and a whole group of experiences. So communication and swallowing are part of the speech pathology scope of practice. Okay. The other thing um, that 
is really important for us is how we reflect on our own practice and how we are open to new learning. So as you come into this health degree, if you like, there's going to be experiences and opportunities and sometimes you might think, oh, that I wasn't really, I really want to work with kids. Um, so I, I feel really uncomfortable going into a hospital and working with a sick person who's had a stroke. But actually, be open to that experience because that's about the lifelong learning that's really important as you're uh, as you sort of embark on a career in speech pathology. So open to experience and opportunity. Sometimes things are going to feel a bit uncomfortable, but there's learning in that, okay? And the other thing that we um, need you to be developing in your skills and your knowledge is around communication and professional communication and professional conduct. Um, and there's lots of opportunities within the university to do that. It's not just on placement. It's actually how you're communicating with us as lecturers, how you're communicating with each other, um, how you're communicating with your clients as you go out and starting doing practice. So uh, we're giving you lots of opportunities with that. But what I would say is try and look after yourself. You know, uni has lots of peaks and troughs and demands and look after each other, okay? So there's sort of an um, invitation for you to look after your group and cohort. Um, that's, that's important. And if in doubt, ask. That would be my third thing to say, is that it's really uh, important that you just keep your communication open. Um, don't let things kind of brew. Sometimes that group mentality, things can get a bit um, heightened, and, and heightened and heated sometimes. Just put it on the discussion forum or contact your um, topic coordinator or your, your class rep, you'll get class reps, um, and then um, you'll be able to kind of work through whatever the issue might be um, with support. Do you have any questions of me? So here's a little pop quiz question for you. How many uh, muscles are there, intrinsic and extrinsic, of the larynx? <laughs> you don't have to, to give me the result now, <laughs> but I'll leave it with you. Okay, how many muscles are there of the voice box, intrinsic and extrinsic? <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. And because I'm a language specialist, I don't actually know. <laughs> Okay. Um, guys, Jane mentioned just then that we'll have a class rep. So you're probably wondering what that's about. So each level of the bachelor program, um, we like to have two people who act as the representatives for their cohort. And then on a regular basis, those representatives meet with me as the course coordinator and Catherine as the student engagement coordinator um, to bring any issues from the cohort to us and for us to be uh, taking issues, I suppose, and letting the cohort know through the student reps any information we want you all to know. We will, of course, communicate in other ways via uh, the flow sites, the general bachelor flow site. Has everybody um, got access to the general bachelor of speech pathology flow site? Yep, good. So with your enrolment, that should be automatic that you get access to there. And that's the sort of forum where we might post information about what's happening. Um, are you okay, Dave, for example? Information we want to convey to everybody about, for example, the COVID stuff last year. Um, access to Flinders Medical Centre you would have seen I've posted just recently. Um, and anything um, that's brought up through the class reps that we want everyone to know about, um, we'll, we'll post through there. So... I'm bringing this up now because I want you to have a think about over lunch and I'll be calling out for some reps very shortly as the semester commences whether you yourself would like to represent your group. So as you get to know people, um, just think about your own qualities and what you could bring to that role as a representative for your cohort 
It's an opportunity to stand up into a leadership role. Um, it certainly looks really good on your CV as you get through the course and are looking to get a job at the end of um, your studies that you've volunteered in these kind of leadership roles. You don't have to do it this year. You might want to think about it in second year, third year or fourth year. I'll call for those reps again. Um, but if you think you're a good communicator and um, would like to have a little bit more knowledge of the inner sanctum, I suppose, um, you can think about stepping up into that role. Any questions about that? Great. I'll hand back to I think as um, Joe said and moving on from what Jane said as well, building on from what Jane said, um, it's another opportunity to practice your professionalism, you're developing skills in that way, uh, communicating with your lecturers and your speech pathology team in a different way um, and I would reinforce that it's something that is great to have on your CV. Uh, it's one of those things that you can talk about once you get to interviews um, uh, about the part that you played and what you gained from it and what you contributed and um, how that brings something different to the workplace um, from when you're competing against others. Um, for those positions. You may have seen the speech pathology um, from Flinders Uni video, which um, was only published um, just over a week ago. Um, it's worth having a look at. Um, with um, Yes, we can play that for sure. Um, with Jordana um, as our placement um, coordinator um, to help you have an idea about the um, range of areas that we can work in as speech pathologists. But what I particularly wanted to highlight mm. is that it's not difficult to get a job as a speech pathologist. Mm. Once you graduate, um, we are continuing to grow uh, nationally and internationally. Um, all of our graduates um, have positions within six months of graduating, those who are seeking positions. That's the stats, isn't it, Jane? I think it's something like that from both our Masters and Bachelors programs. Um, you'll see where I'm going to now is the Bachelor of Speech Pathology. Um, oh, that was the wrong one, sorry. Oh, that was the Honours program. Although it's good to know about the Honours program. It's good program. to know about that and I can talk <laughs> to you about that in a minute. Um, if you're, some people have been asking about what topics you should be enrolling in and so on. This is a really good place to go to where you look at all of the um, topics that you should be studying in first year, in second year, in third year and in fourth year. So it's a bit like that um, diagram that I showed you before, the progression of the topics across the four years. But as you go to each one, you can click into it and actually get all the information that you need. Let's go into that. Let's go into psychology and then you can see how many classes you'll be doing in each of these topics, um, what the things are that you'll be learning about a topic in the topic description um, and you'll um, be able to search for your timetable and there are learning outcomes that you should be achieving, etc. So all a one-stop shop for all of the topics information. However, you will also get that information through your flow sites. Each of your topic coordinators will be posting a topic book that has all that information in it as well. So, where have we found the video? I think if you go to YouTube, oh, the okay. other tab, yeah, yep. and then search for Jordana, it will come up. Jordana? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> Is it there already? Will it come up? Jordana Mayo. Yep. Oh, sorry, Mayo. Wasn't her last name. Yeah. You put speech pathology, yeah. Jordana is the dancer of our speech pathology team, as I mentioned, who was a professional dancer before she came um, to speech pathology. There, oh, she, there is. she is. Hi, 
my name's Jordana Mayo and I'm the Placement Education Coordinator for the Speech Pathology programs at Flinders University. I was inspired to get into a career in speech pathology because I love sciences and I love language and these two areas are combined in the discipline of speech pathology. I worked in the acute setting in one of the major metropolitan hospitals here in South Australia and I've worked with clients who have had some sort of neurological event, whether it be stroke, traumatic brain injury or a neurodegenerative disease. I really enjoy working with the clients and their families as well and looking at goals and also early rehab strategies. Being able to communicate and swallow food and drink is fundamental to a good quality of life and that's what we have the privilege of doing as speech pathologists, helping people who may have compromised swallowing function or a compromised ability to communicate with others. We provide both diagnosis and treatment strategies and we work with people across the lifespan. We may work with babies in neonatal intensive care units, right through to the aged care population or people in palliative care. We work with people who have developmental delays, brain injury, stroke, disability, dementia and other problems that can affect voice, fluency, speech or language. So the diversity in what we can do as we work as speech pathologists is really great. Health is a growing industry both nationally and internationally, so you will never have a problem finding a job as a speech pathologist. Our graduates have an excellent reputation in industry and many are offered graduate positions prior to finishing their degree. You may choose to work clinically as a speech pathologist when you finish your degree, but you may also choose to work as a policy advisor, as a manager, a project officer, or pursue a career in research. Flinders University has the highest number of placement hours of any degree in Australia. And in fact, if you study in our Masters of Speech Pathology program, you'll be on placement in your second week of the course. We offer placements in regional South Australia, also in New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania. We have strong connections with the Northern Territory and we offer placements in Darwin and Catherine. And we also offer international placements. We have our very own interprofessional health clinic on campus at Flinders. Health2Go provides multidisciplinary services to our community and our students provide speech pathology services working interprofessionally with other disciplines through this clinic. You'll have the opportunity to work with real clients and their families to improve health outcomes for the community. We have an exceptional teaching team which I feel very privileged to be a part of. Our team's made up of clinical specialists who work in the field, but also internationally renowned researchers. The benefits of smaller cohorts means we can really get to know our students and develop long lasting relationships. We often have students wanting to pursue careers in research once they finish their degree or come back and guest lecture or offer their time to supervise placement as placement educators. So we offer the Bachelor of Speech Pathology as a four year undergraduate degree and you could choose to do honours as part of that degree. We also offer a Masters of Speech Pathology two year postgraduate program. Why come to Flinders? Because Flinders are leaders in health and care. I studied here at Flinders University and I remember some of my lecturers and some of the amazing stories they could tell us. We have real clinicians, experts in the field who are teaching our students and are able to give those real world examples, examples of clients that they've seen the day before or the plans that they're making for clients that they're going to see the day after. And I think if you study here at Flinders University, that's what you get. I hope you've been able to see the diversity in working as a speech pathologist and I hope you've got all the information you needed. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch. So that's really exciting that um, we're getting the opportunity through our marketing um, and communications people at Flinders Uni. So some of you had a marketing degree you were talking about or have studied marketing, um, to actually get this message out further to people. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and the three of us are very glad it was Jordana and not us doing that. <laughs> um, I was just going to um, let you know, and I can see our, our lovely guest speaker is here now. That's fantastic. That we do have an embedded honours program. You may have seen um, Jordana talking about the honours program. 
and we mentioned it before. So if you'd like to do the speech pathology degree with honours, it is an embedded honours program, which means you don't have to do any um, extra years or anything. It's all within the four years of study. And um, you take it up, it's basically an 18 month program. You take it up in the middle of third year. You do a couple of extra or different assignments to the regular Bachelor of Speech Pathology program in third year including, for example, looking at a literature review and ethics, looking at ethics applications. Um, and then in fourth year, you, with one of us, as a, your supervisor, will undertake a research project um, and you'll have your clinical placement still, as you saw in fourth year, but at the beginning and the end, uh, that sort of sandwich your honours research program. So we'll be talking more about that in third year, but just to keep that in mind, if you wanted to study honours, you can here at Flinders. Um, Jane and myself are both um, researchers in the department um, and we regularly take honours students. Um, Jane was talking about her research before. I'm also a researcher as an academic and a teacher and my research is in the area of dysphagia, which is swallowing impairment and communication difficulties um, that adults acquire, often from a stroke or, for example, from dementia. So they're the areas that I research in. And Jane's expertise, as she was mentioning, is in voice. We have Sebastian Doltgen, who you'll meet at lunchtime, who is another researcher in the department. Again, his specialty is really uh, neuroscience and, and brain stuff, uh, transcortical direct stimulation of the brain, as interventions for people with um, stroke, for example, or progressive neurological disease and looking at their swallowing. Um, we have Beck Francis, who's a new academic to um, our department, who's also a researcher, and Emma, when she comes back from maternity leave, researches in the space of disability um, and uh, um, alternative communication methods and so on. So there's a wide range of skill that we have in our own department, plus we have access to the researchers across the college. So you're, if you're interested in that kind of pathway, those options are available to you as well. Great, thanks Jo. And so now we have Paige Ablett who is here to talk with you about the Flinders Uni Speech Pathology and Audiology Association. Yeah. to start the slideshow. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Cool. So as Catherine said, my name's Paige and I'm this year's president of the Flinders University Speech Pathology and Audiology Association, or we just call it FUSPA for short. Um, and so this is kind of a branch now off of FUSA, who you might have already heard of. We're actually starting to receive some funding from them from last year, but we couldn't do much with it last year. Um, so from this year as well, hopefully we'll get some funding from them and basically, we're just an, an association that um, we want as many of you guys to get involved in and we run all the social events throughout the year, so pub crawls, bake sales, fundraisers, um, we do jumpers and things like that. So I'm just going to do a quick talk about all of these separate things. So as I said, I'm the president and then we've got James Mead and Jessica Partosh, who are the other two executives this year. They're in audiology, so you might not see them as much. Um, but again, as we're associated with audiology, we do everything together. As I said, recent funding from FUSPA and some of the events that we run. So some of our pub crawls, um, these are probably one of our most popular events throughout the year. We try and aim to do at least two in a year. Um, and, but this year we're, we're hoping to maybe squeeze in a third one, given we couldn't do any last year. So um, what we do is... Um, we get everyone involved in creating the T-shirts, so we all put up these designs on Facebook and people vote on the one that they think is the best. And then we um, contact different venues, starting with pubs and ending with some of the clubs down Hindley. Um, and these are the, some of the T-shirts in the past. I think this was two years ago. Um, so some of the designs. And yeah, we try and, but we're trying to get it a bit more audiology as well, so we've got some um, audiology stuff on there. But... Yeah, so keep an eye out. I'll talk about the Facebook page a bit later, but um, when we're starting to take um, some design suggestions, yeah. All right, cool. Um, so bake sales and fundraising events, we also run these. 
mainly um, around the times where it's like Speech Pathology Awareness Week or Swallowing Awareness Week um, to raise money for organisations. In the past, we've done Can Do for Kids. Um, I think that's the main one we've done at the moment, but hoping to do some more with that. Um, we use them, as I said, to raise money. Recently, last year, we ran a speech path versus audiology soccer match, and we also had some carnival games and things like that there, and that went really well. So we're hoping to maybe do maybe like a basketball or another soccer match or even just a, a night of just um, carnival games and things like that, just as a fun fundraiser, but more to come with that. Um, we're also looking at maybe quiz nights, doing some raffles and a bit more just to raise some money. Because as like everyone, we lost a bit last year through the COVID times and we couldn't run the events. This is the one that probably is coming up quite soon. So early in term one, we put jumpers out. This is the design from last year. We also have hoodies as well. Um, and we offer them in a range of colours, like, well, range, I say grey and black and blue. So not really a large range, but the basics. Um, and we might be changing up the design, so again, that's something we'll be putting um, feelers out for, some suggestions. This was last year's, we added the 2020. We're thinking of maybe having the option this year for the 2021 or not, depending on if you're graduating and things like that. Prices range from $40 to $50, and um, they'll be out in the next two weeks. We'll be taking jumper orders um, to get them sorted. We like to get them in by winter. So, they're really good quality as well. Um, I mean, I have to say that because I sell them, but um, they are really good quality. I've got, I think, three now, and they've lasted me up until now, so pretty good. Um, this is something we really, really want to do again this year. Again, we couldn't do it last year, and this was um, our bowl. So that image is from two years ago, and um, it was a really good night. Um, we plan I can't remember where it was now. I think it was Adelaide Pavilion, but it was just like a networking, socialising event. People came, um, we had DJs, um, and people just got dressed up. And again, just one of those socialising things to, so you can um, meet new people, come with your friends. Yeah, so that was a good night as well. So fingers crossed we'll be able to organise one this year, depending on what happens. Okay, so if you're thinking this sounds like something you would either like to help out with, um, we have a committee and we are always open to new members. As I keep going back to last year, but last year we couldn't do much, so our committee was really small. So we're really hoping to build that back up again this year with the help of you guys and all the other year levels. Um, so if you're interested, um, we've got the Facebook page, and it's not only good for events, but we do buy swapping and selling of textbooks, so secondhand textbooks. Um, we have job opportunities come up on there, volunteering opportunities, and of course the event information. Um, as I said, we're always looking for new members, so um, what we're thinking of doing this year was end of week two-ish, we're hoping, um, we'll do a little social gathering either up at the tavern or somewhere local around here where you guys can come down um, and all the, we'll be inviting all the year levels and the masters and audiology students as well, and just for some cheap food and drinks um, and see you know, how we go about mingling and meeting new people, because that's one of the best things here is being able to meet not just your year level, but everyone above as well, and in audiology as well. There's some really cool people. Um, so as I said, we're doing that, and we'll also be holding um, our first meeting. We have to do an annual general meeting each year now, so we'll be holding that early in term one, and that's where you guys can come along and help us to plan these events, um, so they're as good as they can be. So yeah, I've got some flyers for later when we all go to lunch um, and I've put a little QR code on there so you can just scan that and it will take you straight to the page. But other than that, that is all I have to say. So thank you. I'll see you around. Hello, beautiful. How are we going, guys? Uh, my name's Hugo. I'm just going to get something up on the screen here if I can. Beautiful. Uh, do you still need this YouTube tab? No. no? Awesome. I can find my YouTube video now. So, if I didn't say before, I probably did. My name's Hugo. I'm the medicine co president of FERS. So, FERS is the Flinders University Rural Health Society. And it's really a society for anyone who is interested or 
has sort of an inkling towards whether they like to go rurally at all. Um, we really try and just give people the opportunity to have a taste of the country life and to see if it might be something for them. So instead of me just rabbling away here and missing details, I've been able to whip up a video with some help from a few people. So I'll play that for you and then I'll take any questions afterwards and let you know what we've got coming up. So hopefully we can sound. We do have sound. Hi, I'm Kirsty. I'm Hugo. My name's Vivek, and we are the co-president of FERS. So FERS is Flinders University Rural Health Society, and FERS is all about giving students the opportunity who have an interest in rural or country practice to get exposed to it. So we run events through all out the year, which is all about getting you guys a little taste of the country. So some of the events that we run throughout the year are like our rural high school visits, where we go out to rural high schools and talk to students there and tell them about the degrees that we're studying. A great thing about it as well is you also get to see lots of attractions the state has to offer, like the big orange out in the Riverland and the painted silos at Canalpin. Other events we run as well are experiences of the Royal Flying Doctors, where some people even get to go on the ride-along program with them. We always have our plastering night and wilderness health night, where we have the snake catchers come and have a talk and tell and show us all the snakes that they catch over the years. We've got a quiz night coming up this year, as well as the new Riverland camp. So great things coming. So enough of us talking about it. How about you hear about the experience from your graduated past FERS members? Hi everyone, my name's Alison and I'm a speech pathologist working with Country Health in the Riverland. I've been here for 12 months now after graduating from Flinders in 2019. And during my time at Flinders, FERS was a huge part of my whole university experience. I started out as the discipline rep for speech pathology um, and then in my third year I had the opportunity to be the co-president for Allied Health um, and if I had to pick my best experience from my time with FERS it would probably be a combination of all the rural high school visits so uh, I had the chance to go out to Renmark a couple of times and also to Mount Gambia um, and these visits are where you go out uh, with a bunch of other FERS members to a rural town either for a day or overnight and uh, I guess present to rural, uh, rural high school students encouraging them to come to uni and study a health degree and sharing what you love about your degree but at the same time you just get to meet a whole bunch of other uni students from different health degrees uh, and get to know what they're studying but also just have a bit of fun. I think either way if you sort of uh, know that you want to work somewhere rural after you graduate or if you just want to meet some other people while you're studying at uni either way I think joining FERS is um, would be a great idea. Hello there uh, my name's Sam I'm currently just an everyday member of FERS, but in the past, in 2019, I was the co-president of medicine, I'm currently a final year medical student and also the president of the Flinders Medical Student Society. Uh, I decided to join FERS in my first year of uni because I was interested in rural health. Uh, I grew up in a semi-rural location and was pretty keen to sort of get involved in that throughout medical school and it seemed like a really friendly bunch of people. Uh, my favourite experience with FERS is pretty hard to actually think of what the best one was. There's quite a few. I think probably the RFDS experience where you get to go up with the Royal Flying Doctor Service uh, and see what they do for the day and sit in the plane and see what happens uh, at the base. I thought that was pretty amazing. But I also really enjoyed some of the other events like Wilderness Health Night uh, and even just getting to meet a bunch of like-minded sort of students was a really great experience, especially the fact that it was multidisciplinary. So it was all of health sort of got me just out of being just in the medical sphere and getting to meet a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of really, really interesting degrees. Um, in terms of where I see myself going in the future, I'm pretty keen in a career in rural medicine. I got to spend my third year uh, in the Brosa Valley, which is sort of like semi-rural and had a really great time there and pretty keen to go back to working in that kind of an environment. Um, and I suppose I really got a lot out of FERS in my, well, I'm not done with my time there, but over the past four years, I definitely learned a lot more about uh, rural health. I le learned a lot about sort of like the inequalities in rural health and what we can do as students to really work on that. Um, I got to go to the NRHSN National Council and meet up with a whole lot of other sort of 
enthusiastic and like-minded students uh, and they taught me a lot and it was a really interesting experience. Um, and I also, like I said, I got to meet uh, so many different people around the uni from so many different degrees that I wouldn't have ever had a chance to interact with otherwise. Uh, and they've been a really great bunch of my friends. So yeah, it's been a really great experience and I definitely recommend you join up. So if you'd like to become a member of FERS, register at the NRHSN website. And if you want to keep up to date with all our events and what we've got going on, follow us on Facebook. So that pretty much covers most of it, guys. That's what FERS is and what we get about and do. Uh, we're going to have a similar to your own uh, student club. Uh, we're going to have an event probably in week two sometime as well up at the TAV. So a bit of a meet and greet, get a mingle and meet people. We're going to have an AGM as well at the end of March. So if you are quite interested in what we're doing, more than welcome to come along and attend to that. And we're always still looking for people to jump on the committee in discipline rep roles or other positions if you like. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, it's free to register. There's no charges at all. Once you've registered, you're eligible to come to all our events. Um, and that's pretty much it. Any burning questions? Beautiful. Love it. Great. Thanks, guys. highly recommend uh, being involved in both of those groups to really enhance your experience um, here at uni, to expand your horizons, thinking um, as we have discovered today in our getting to know you activity, we have quite a number of rural students here coming into first year. Um, and even though you have that rural background, um, it might kind of change some of that uh, view of what you can um, offer. And for city folk, it will certainly um, expand your horizons. So now we have uh, representatives coming from FUSA who have arrived just at the perfect time to um, chat with you further about the um, student association um, for the whole university that you've heard about through the introduction videos. Come on down, perfect timing. Microphone there if you need it. Um, this one? No. Did we have trouble getting the doodles? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Everybody practice today. It's not been the way that we were told by security it would be, so apologies for that. Um, you got your just you got here just at the perfect time. I thought my shirt might have helped, but it sort of already says, like... Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, can we start? Yeah, can we start? Is this... Can people hear me if I'm here? Is this... Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean. I'm your FUSA student president for the year of 2021. And we've got Josh here from Student Assist, who's one of our amazing student advocates, and also health and counselling. Yes. And then do you have any other hats? No, just the no, two. No, just the two. Um, <laughs> So our job is essentially to work for you and provide services for you. Um, all of the things we provide get funded through your student services and amenities fee, which is that I think it's $200 a semester or $120 a semester. I'm not sure the exact amount, but most students pay it. Um, and you can also defer it onto your hex debt. So if you're in your first year, you could, if that fee comes up, you can defer it on your hex debt and you don't have to worry about paying it immediately. But that's what pays for all of your O-Week and all of your fun stuff throughout the year and all the pub crawls and clubs and community stuff. So that's kind of a list of the summary of all the stuff we do there. So we've got Student Council, which I am the president of, which is your opportunity to be represented on council, and these are the people you contact. Normally I have little fold-out things, but um, you'll see those at the O-Week stalls if you make your way up there. If you want contact details for all the people in the team. We also do, obviously, events and clubs. Normally we have... In a non-COVID environment, we do a lot of pub crawls, balls, um, a bunch of other student events, but it's rethinking that for the moment. Um, 
and yeah, and then there's a bunch of other stuff. So my job on student council is basically to represent you and work for you. So I am here to take any of your issues and concerns, no matter how big or small, we're here to help, whether it be a minor thing in your course or something that doesn't make very much sense and you're going, why does the university work this way? A lot of the time it's because someone made a mistake or nobody thought, why would this happen? And normally, um, it's very fortunate to get in contact with me or someone else on student council who can then get in contact with the academics and do a lot of the work to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, another big major thing we're working on is the car parking campaign, which you may have seen signs for. Um, I'm going to play a video of myself talking because I hate listening to my own voice, but it's a lot easier to explain there than me repeat it here. We are calling on Flinders University Vice-Chancellor to revoke changes in car park prices. Following over 1,000 petition signatures in one week from the announcement, students and staff have spoken out about the surprise price hike for those who choose Flinders as the place to study or work. Flinders University announced a campus car parking price hike from $200 to $420 for students and $200 to $1,300 for staff. These price hikes are effectively pay cuts for staff and fee increases for students. Making parking unaffordable for many will also significantly jeopardise the safety of students, especially those forced to walk or take public transport after dark. We are calling on the Flinders University President and Vice-Chancellor Colin Sterling to stop the massive parking price hikes, implement a concession rate for low-income earners and healthcare card holders, allocate a minimum of $50,000 worth of parking permits for students accessing financial assistance, increase Flinders loop bus services after hours and out side of semesters and allocate a further $50,000 worth of financial assistance for students with disabilities who do not qualify for a South Australian disability parking permit. So please sign the petition, help us make Flinders a place all students can participate in and stop the parking price hikes. But yeah, so they're the type of things that FUS is able to do, so if you have any issues or concerns, we can, we've got your back and we're here to support. I'm gonna pass on to Josh, who's gonna take the rest of the presentation. But yeah, feel free to get in contact if you need anything. Cool. Um, so yeah, so we also have uh, clubs that are um, managed by FUSA. Um, all the non-sporting clubs are managed by us especially, and Adam, who's the club's manager, is the go-to guy. So um, if I've got any questions about that, you can contact Adam. Uh, at our office, um, but we have a website with all the clubs that are listed and information about how to join or start a new club if you'd like. And student Assist, so that's where I work in. Um, so we're a free and confidential service. Um, we help provide guidance and support through sort of academic matters that can occur sometimes when you're at university. I've got a, another video to sort of show you about us. <laughs> Being a uni student is both rewarding and challenging. You'll learn heaps and meet amazing people who'll be your friends for life. But sometimes things don't run so smoothly with your studies or your finances. Student Assist can help you resolve these problems. We can help you with academic difficulties like issues with your grade for an assignment, concerns that you might fail your placement, academic integrity issues like having referenced an idea incorrectly, or how to deal with failing a topic. We understand university policies and can offer advice to get your studies back on track. We can also help you with finances. When you can't pay your bills and your electricity is about to be cut off, when your credit card gets a workout, when you're overwhelmed by bills, our financial counsellor can help you get most debts under control. We can provide you with emergency assistance like food parcels and metro cards and also interest-free loans to help with study expenses. Student Assist is here to help, regardless of your campus location or study mode. If you run into problems, don't hesitate to contact us and then we can help you make the most out of uni. So yeah, these are sort of typically the most sort of common issues that we um, work with students on with academic matters. 
Um, I'd probably just stress to you that um, a lot of these issues are really, um, can be easily resolved. Um, there's a lot of good people working at the university and everyone wants you to succeed. Um, you know, and um, we've got you back here so we can guide you through what your options are, um, just give you some advice about how the university works and around the policies and procedures especially. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, financial counsellor, Helen. Um, often while you're at university, finances can be pretty tough, especially around placements and um, things like that. Um, we've got an interest-free student loan. So that's for things like if your laptop conks out on you, um, we can give you a $500 interest-free loan. The repayments are about $25 a fortnight. Um, we've also got emergency uh, financial assistance. So just short for a week or so, we can we can help you out with a, a Woolworths voucher or Metro card. Um, sometimes we have petrol vouchers as well. And student reps, so we have a um, student um, representative officer who helps provide training for students. So that can be around sort of like leadership things or um, cultural training. Um, we've got more information about that on the website. Um, there's grants available for $800. Um, I don't have too much information about the process of that, but if you were interested, um, you can just give us a call or um, speak to Kate, who is the uh, officer. Um, I week, uh, which is this week. Um, so we've got a team that run a lot of the events uh, on campus, and there's more events coming. Um, I think with COVID and everything, it's sort of, sort of playing it by ear about what happens, but. Um, if you register as a member with us, um, you get like a newsletter that comes out and they'll tell you what's sort of going on. And that's how to contact us. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, thanks so much no, thank for you. opening it and again, uh, apologies for the difficulty that we had <laughs> getting in to uh, see us. I appreciate it very much no, because your you. services are essential for the students to know about. Thank you. Thank you. Really thank you. Thank okay. You. See you. So the next person that we have coming to talk with us is from Health and Counselling Services who hasn't arrived just yet. So if you want to get up and have a bit of a wriggle around um, and I will just go and um, have a bit of a look to see uh, if... Chris is on his way. Any questions before before we have our next person come in? Great. We will have our next um, proper break uh, in about 15 minutes. Um, but I'll just go and look and see if I can find our health and counselling rep.
Hi guys, sorry about that delay. Um, we can't seem to find uh, the gentleman who was coming down from health counselling and disability. Uh, maybe he's got stuck at an entrance. So what we thought we'd do, we'd just show you the website um, and walk you through that so that you've got immediate access to that if you need it. We've then got our mentors coming um, to meet you and then we'll be having lunch, okay? So we've got a little break before that, so... Um, yes, so we yeah. will actually give you a little break if you needed the amenities and so on. Yeah. In fact, we could have done that then. We could have. Never mind, we didn't Never know. Never mind, we didn't know. Um, so, we're human. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, health counselling and disability um, services, you will see that this has, that I found this um, just by um, actually Googling health counselling and disability Flinders um, Uni. It actually, it's in that link in one of the um, previous slides around student.flinders.edu.au slash support. Um, so this will take you to a range of services. So the health services, you may not be aware that there are GPs available on campus um, who you can uh, book in and see um, and that there's a range of services that they are able to provide in terms of first aid if you're in need of immediate help but it's not an emergency type situation, um, health screening, um, as well as um, other referrals. So um, if you're needing a medical certificate um, for something, so they are a really great service to keep in mind um, and they also provide um, vaccination um, services as well. So that's uh, the first area to be aware of, um, that they're available um, at, um, on the main campus um, up the hill. Counselling services, as mentioned um, today. So you may already um, have um, access to a mental health um, provider in the community. That might be a psychologist, social worker, psychotherapist, um, which is fantastic. But you might be wanting to talk with somebody or you may not have this organised and you may just want to um, have a chat with one of the counsellors because you particularly want somebody who understands the student experience. Um, and this is where the counselling services um, come in. Um, they are very used to um, supporting students um, because that's what they do, that's what they're set up to do. They provide something like over 5,000 um, appointments per year um, to students um, and you can access um, a certain number of those services um, every year. So it's really worth keeping their um, services in mind. So they can particularly talk about academic issues. We've all experienced time management and procrastination issues. Um, and everybody faces those at some time or another. Anxiety, um, anxiety about presenting um, or more generalised um, anxiety um, difficulties. They can assist if you're needing letters to support um, your withdrawal or um, fee um, remission um, and can also support if you're wanting to talk about um, extra support that you might be be requiring, as well as a whole range of personal um, issues as well. All of those counsellors are either social work or psychology trained um, and deal with a whole spectrum of difficulties um, from what we might consider as more immediate short-term issues to longer-term, more chronic health and wellbeing, mental health um, difficulties. So really um, keep them in mind. So the other um, area to consider is disability services. Um, so the main issue that they might be useful um, to consider is if you do have an ongoing um, physical or mental health issue and you would like, think that you would benefit from some additional time um, for assignments or for exams, you can talk with one of the disability advisors um, about what your eligibility for an access plan. 
and they will um, fill out a verification form which can then give you, for example, an extra 10 minutes per hour um, in an exam time um, or um, a automatic extension for all assignments um, of five days, for example, without you having to provide a medical certificate every time you're applying for that extension. Um, so it's really important to consider that. Some of our students require an alternative exam arrangement. Um, so that means that um, people who are overwhelmed by sitting an exam um, in a group with a large number of other students and have, um, can request to um, sit an exam in a quieter room with a smaller number of students. Um, as the um, representative, the president of FUSA talked about, parking is an issue on um, campus. Um, if you have a particular um, difficulty that requires you to have a parking permit so that you are able to um, access buildings more easily, then that is something they can also assist you with. Anything else that you thought important for us to mention about that, Joe? before we have a quick break? reminded me with the extra time for exams that if you are a student who has um, English not as your first language but rather second, third or fourth, um, you actually get some extra time in exams as well um, and the international office can help you with um, a student card that indicates that. That was the only thing that came mm. to mind mm. and it looks like Lauren is here. So we might have just a quick, um, I know we had a bit of a break before, but it, just in case anybody needs the amenities, um, do go and have a, perhaps a five minute break, 10 minute break, and then we'll come back for our final session before lunch, which is meeting our mentors. Hi everyone, welcome back to our last bit before lunch, I'll hand over to the amazing Lauren and Claire, and our mentors. Hello, everybody. Oh, I am not even switched on. Hang on. Hello, hello. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Sullivan, and I am a lecturer here. So I actually won't be seeing a lot of you this year because um, I do most of my work in second, third year, and in the master's program. But um, Claire Coulter is um, one of our newer lecturers and she's taking over from me doing 1104, um, one of your topics for first semester. And um, so I'm kind of going to buddy with Claire um, because she's also new. And um, just like you will have your beautiful mentors down here, Claire and I are buddying up a bit. So um, we've, we're going to be helping each other out, um, which is great. And as part of your 1104 topic, you are going to be involved in the peer mentoring program. So I have organised for you all to be in groups of about eight or nine people so that you can get to know each other. Um, and you will be guided by our beautiful third year group down here who are going to um, help you through first semester. So um, it's a, a fantastic program and it provides you with someone other than us to go to uh, to answer all your questions. Um, they have a wealth of information. They don't know it, but they, they don't re realise how much they know, but they know a lot um, to help you through because this is all pretty new and um, they will help you with where to go with things and how to find your way through the flow system, which is our online computer, uh, our learning system online and uh, a whole range of different things. So they are, will be your go-to person. And it's, it's nice to have someone else around the university that you see a face and go, oh, I know that person. Um, and once you get into your groups, you'll also um, have people that you're familiar with around so that you don't feel quite so much like this is brand new and because I know that a lot of you have come straight from high school where you've been in the same high school for five years with the same people and so it can be really a bit daunting starting something really fresh and new 
with a whole group of new people. So um, I'm going to get my beautiful mentors to come up and stand at the front and they're going to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they remember, if they remember, from their peer mentoring program when they were in your shoes only a couple of years ago and, um, and then what has kind of inspired them to become mentors for you guys. So I'm going to start with Gus. Hey, I'm Gus. Um, I can remember when I was in your position and uh, how much having a mentor really helped. Um, firstly, for you know, getting to know other people in the cohort, but also getting to figure out all the little things that you don't quite realise at the start about university. And I think um, the reason why I'm here standing up in front of you is because I want to give back um, and because the experience was so positive for me in the end. So this is really an opportunity for everyone to ask those questions. You know, um, we're all here, we've all been through it before, we all understand. My name's Lauren and one of the things that I found most beneficial from the mentor program was that I was able to make friends and connect with people because they put you in a program or they put you in groups and you get to know those people very well because you're catching up one time a week for an hour just chatting about life and another thing that I found really helpful was that our being a mentor we've gone through the exact same, same assignments as you have and we've done all of the same work that you're going to be doing and we're here to support you and help you through that as well and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to become a mentor was because I really valued that experience and like Gus said I wanted to give back. Hi so my name is Muskan. The reason um, I think mentoring is so great I remember first year I had no one from high school coming in doing this degree and I had no one but having that mentoring experience, I got to meet my mentor and meet the people in the group. I actually still, you know, I can still talk to those people. It's not like you meet those people and you're gonna be with them throughout the course. It's very great. The reason I chose to become a mentor was because I wanna give back that experience. And I also think I wanna be that person you can come and talk to and not feel like you're lost in first year, which I think sometimes you do feel. Hi, my name is Emma and I remember how stressful the first few weeks were especially because you didn't know what the expectations were so I think mentoring really helped with the expectations of speech pathology and my mentor really helped me learn what speech pathology like the, what the degree structure is like so the reason I wanted to be a mentor was yes to give back at that and because I know how stressful the first few weeks were. Hey going on Mel um, what I liked about the mentor program was um, building friendships um, learning lots of hints and tips that you probably wouldn't hear from the lecturers because as a student you shh, you don't know them <laughs> um, yeah because obviously that they, they were a, long, a student a longer time ago no offense <laughs> pass the mic Mel um, no and I just um, the reason I'm doing it is just because I want to give give back that experience and yeah, have that extra person for you to come to instead of if you're feeling nervous to approach these guys. They don't bite, but sometimes you think they might. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to give back to those. No, they don't. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia. Um, I found the mentoring experience like really beneficial in my first year. It was great to have that support from someone who has been where you are and guide you through transitioning to a new degree, new university. Um, so yeah, I chose to be a mentor because I wanted to give back that positive experience that I had and just help you guys. Um, I'm Caitlin. Um, I enjoyed mentoring because I made heaps of friends in mentoring sessions and I'm still friends with most of them now. Um, my mentor I was actually on placement with as well so it was really nice having someone to support me through that um, and I love our degree, I love speech pathology and it can be tricky at times I think it's important that we all support each other to get through it so that's why I'm doing mentoring. Hi I'm Millie. Um, I loved the mentoring program because it was just a chance to go to a group when you feel like you don't know anyone and everything's brand new. This is something that you can always go to. And I also felt like my mentor was someone that I could always approach. And although we love our lecturers, sometimes it is a bit scary to go to them. It's like, oh my gosh, this is brand new. 
But yeah, we are always here and that's why I wanted to be a mentor is because I felt like I had someone and so I want to be someone for you guys and I think we all feel that. So yeah. Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, similar to what everyone else has said, I had a very positive mentoring experience in my first year of university and I can completely understand how overwhelming it can be, especially in those first few weeks with organisation and learning all the new terms and everything like that. So I would love to give back the, ex um, the wisdom that we have gained over our two years in the degree. And um, yeah, similar to what everyone else has said, it's a very positive experience, well it should be anyway, and I've met some of my closest friends through my mentoring group in first year. Hi, I'm Emma. Uh, I moved into state before studying um, at university, so I thought that the mentoring program was a really good way to get settled into not only moving away from home, but just being at university in general. Um, like Lucy said, you get to know all of the new terms, like everything's a bit unfamiliar. So I think this is the best way to get that new experience sort of going. Um, and th yeah, that's why I sort of wanted to do it as well, just to give those kids that are rural the same opportunity. Hi guys, I'm Zoe. Um, similar to what everyone else said, I had such a positive experience in my mentor group. I was lucky enough to actually meet my best friend at uni in the mentor group. and. As the others have stated, like Speechology is almost like a little family. So it's so important to build those connections. And due to that, I wanted to be a mentor and give back like all the tips and tricks that I learned from my mentor, but also just from being in the degree itself. And yeah, I mean, we've got all so much to share. So I just want to make your, you guys as comfortable as you can in adjusting to uni, which I understand can be super overwhelming. Hello, I'm back again. Um, my name's Paige. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I uh, chose to do mentoring because I loved all the connections that I um, were able to make and also the confidence that it gives you to talk to people from not just your age but different age groups as well, um, as well as people that have a bit more experience than you. I also loved the fact that it gave you that vision into the future of this is what you're aiming to do um, because, you know, you're welcome to ask us questions about what we're doing in our year because I can guarantee we'll be struggling at times as well just like you and you know being able to see that you can move forward in this and you'll be you achieve that and you'll get to the position that you know second year third year and so having that vision forward was really helpful as well yeah hello everyone um, I'm Bridget and I love the fact that I met so many people when I did my from my mentoring group and um because I moved from home, I'm from the country, I was quite homesick, so I'd often go to my mentor and she really gave insight into, you know, how I can cope and things like that, which was good. And I'd like to do it because I'd like to give back the way that my mentor helped me, so. I'm just going to let Claire, as the, the new person, just say hello and introduce herself now. Hi guys, so like Lauren said, I'm Claire and I'm also very new to the uni. I've only been here, this is my third week, I think. So I'm also learning everything. So we'll muddle through together to a degree because I've been working clinically up until a couple of weeks ago. So this is a bit of a shift for me, but I'm very excited to be here with you all. So now we're going to do a bit more. We've had one get to know you activity uh, as a whole group. We're going to do one that also involves the mentors this time uh, before we have lunch. So I think everybody has a phone with them, I would think. So I'd like you to all get out your phones. <laughs> and I'm not going to like get you to ring other people in the group or anything like that because that would be a bit weird anyway. Um, so I'm sure that everybody has a lock screen on their phone or their background. You can choose which one you want to share and... What I'd like you to do, if you're not sitting near other people, you might need to move so that you can chat with other people, chat with at least one other person or in groups of, groups of three or um, small groups and have a chat about the significance of what it is that's on your lock screen or home screen. Um, 
so you don't have to share that with the whole group. <laughs> so... Hello. I just love how that activity got everybody immediately, immediately looking at their lock screens, um, which is fantastic, and starting to do some chatting and, and getting to know each other some more. So what we're going to do before lunch is just to perhaps hear from a few people who ever's willing to share what was on their lock screen or what is on their lock screen, I should say, or home home it's, it's not a home page I'm sorry I'm as my adult children would say I'm such a boomer um so <laughs> I know because that's who's on my lock screen is uh, my 20 uh, 20 year old and 24 year old um so who's happy to share who's on, on there oh go Millie Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Millie. Come on. Somebody's got something. I have a photo of me shopping. I don't know if you saw this. It's about three weeks old. I found it on Instagram. Where we went shopping for the week. Beautiful. We won't get Zach the rooster together with the chooks that somebody talked about that they had. <laughs> Who's next? I've got Blair, my cat. Uh, he's my favourite. <laughs> he talks to me every night without fail. He thinks I'm just a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> oh. What sort of cat is he, Gus? Yeah, of course he does. <laughs> Beautiful. Come on, there must be some other really cool things on your screens. Yep. <laughs> and he makes you smile. Yeah. Love it. Yep. What about that hand up if you've got that hand up? Oh, cool. Love it. Good thought. Well done, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually a really good reminder, Lauren, of um, when you put your photos up um, on to um, the Flow, Flow page, um, to try and do a photo of where it's, we can actually see your face, um, that it's not too far away, which may be in your formal photos, um, so that we can recognise you. Yeah. And as beautiful as uh, my dog is, if I had my dog up there, uh, then you wouldn't know what I look like. So... Um, <laughs> and make sure that it's a photo of you. Yeah, headshot of you, if you can. That would be really appreciated. Well, be kind to us because there's a lot of you. And so it's really nice for us to be able to learn your names. And um, I've just been looking at a list of names over the last few days. And I know a lot of the names, but I don't know the faces that necessarily go with them. So, um, and for Claire, you know, it would be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she's going to get you to do something in the first little assignment um, that is sharing something of yourself that uh, will help her remember, hopefully. So I'm going to think about what that might be. Yeah. 
All right. So our last little bit then before uh, we have lunch together is if mentors could share one tip for surviving first year. So a little bit of thinking time. Oh, Millie's, Millie's ready. Oh, Paige is ready as well. <laughs> I was trying to look at your timetable and capture like really how much time you're spending at work, making friends, at uni, and really think about the time that you've got there and try and make steps of time which is your first door, your first reflection time, as it steps is like first there and you step first, and then make sure that when you do need to do the time, you say, right, that, that's what I'm working to go with. Everyone down here hear that? Yeah. yeah. So it's still recording. Going on from that point, I would say getting a planner. They have some at o, uh, o week, Flinders ones. It has the semester days, it has exam weeks, and I think for me, I, I get that every year. It's so helpful to get. Um, like to put in your due dates and to know when a semester is ending and to know when exams are creeping up on you. They really do creep up on you. <laughs> I would say use the first week and learn APA, which is our referencing, because you don't want to have to spend your assignments worried about that. And it can be annoying in group work if one person isn't referencing properly. So learn your referencing because you're going to have to use it for basically every assignment. So. There is a PDF, if you look it up on Google, just type in Flinders APA referencing and you should find the PDF. You'll get a lecture on it, but it's a very good piece of advice if you've been using it for the next four years. So if you can get a handle on it, that's great. My advice is um, become a to-do list person. I'm, I am. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm at an A meeting. Um, yeah, I have like a mini notebook full of um, like to-do list for absolutely everything. And um, hot tip, if you go to Typo, they have um, erasable highlighters. So you, want, like, you highlight what's important the most and then you can unhighlight it and tick it when it's done. It's amazing. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, my tip is attend your lectures <laughs> um, and try, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to pay attention in them. Yeah. <laughs> Attend your lectures and find a good note taking system as well. Um, my top tip is to become friends with your lecturers because they're really friendly and I ask them so many questions and they're always happy to answer them and they're always welcoming. And yeah, I find I learn through asking a lot of questions. So that's one of my tips. Um, my biggest tip would be to make sure you go to sleep on time and don't let your study eat into your sleep because it's quite important. Um, and the other one was ask questions. If you need help, just ask for it. There's, there's lots of people that are willing to help. You just have to ask for it. Um, my tip would probably be to do with grades. Um, if you probably don't know already, um, if you get a D, that's really good in university. So <laughs> please don't worry. <laughs> if you get a D <laughs> or a C, C is also good. Um, but yeah, so that's probably the one is like don't stress over the grades and what letter it is um, because it all adds up in the end and you'll be better in some areas than others. Um, there are definitely some topics I really did not like and just could not get my head around and there are others that I did really well in and as I said, it just it all adds up um, in the end. So don't don't spend and waste your energy stressing about the small things like that. Cool.
Um, my biggest bit of advice would, would be to make sure you have a support system, whether that's at uni or within the group or it's your family or your partner or whoever. Just make sure that you've got sort of someone out there that's looking out for you, making sure that you're okay. And, like, it does get overwhelming. Like, I won't lie, there are times where, you know, you don't know where to start. So just making sure that, you know, you're also looking after yourself while doing uni, that's important too. Um, my biggest tip would be getting organised quickly. So I would recommend getting a folder for every single subject that you have, um, like a physical folder and also making a folder on your laptop for every subject and putting all those files in that folder so that you can easily find things and come back to things throughout the year and throughout the entire degree. I've just found that to be very helpful and I definitely did not do that into my first year until like second semester and wish that I did because it's so hard finding stuff when you don't have a specific place where everything is. Can I just say on that note, um, in third and fourth year, once you get out into placement um, and you need to start to put together a portfolio and so that will help you from the very beginning if you put things into folders and you know where all your assignments are and you know where all your notes are, you can then easily go back and start to put that portfolio together rather than having to think, oh my God, what did I do with that? So um, that will be helpful for that reason as well. Thanks, Lucy. Um, my biggest tip was is using all your resources. Like sometimes I would forget, you know, I've got my lovely lecturers, I've got the lecture notes, but there's so much out there, even, you know, we've got the library and also just building that social connection, like friends, you know, their resources too, we're all going through the same thing together. And I found having that study group, whether that's from people in your mentor group or just other people you've met in the course is so, so helpful and you can bounce those ideas off each other. Like, yeah, as Emma stated, kind of going on to that is making sure you look after yourself because that is your number one priority as well, yeah. Yeah, that's um, wonderful. I think that's a really great segue into just reminding you that... Um, so thanks for that one, Zoe cause, um, and Emma, because just to remind you that if you are um, finding things a bit overwhelming and all of those fabulous supports that um, our mentors have been, we've, have been talking about to use, you find that you're needing a little bit more, then... Um, hit me up, get in touch with me, um, have a chat with me as some um, student engagement coordinator to, um, to give you a point in the direction of some other supports um, as well. Yeah. So that's all we've got for you this morning. Probably a lot to take in. We will put the slides up on the Bachelor General Flow site, as we said before, so you can come back to it at any time if you want to look up some of those links, some of those websites where you can get some support. Um, we're going to have lunch.